don't want your face in the recording, camera off. <laughs> Thank you, Paz. If you don't mind having your face on the recording, we love to see people going <gasps> and, and all of these beautiful things. So it's fine to leave them on as well. Um, so roll call right now, line 37. You can put your name. Tell us your awesome nature fact about slime molds, multiple slime molds coming in here. Um, butterflies, caterpillar memories, hard sci-fi approve and of course it comes from you chat um please bring in all the cool things uh and now we'll go through some of our reminders so the first one is open life science has a code of conduct as a general rule we ask people to treat one another with the respect that you would like to receive uh it's obviously more complicated than that or it will be a one-line code of conduct when you have a moment uh look at li line 44 on our etherpad right now, uh, openlifesiderorg slash code dash of dash conduct. And you can see the code of conduct, look at it in a bit more detail. Uh, it's not just a document to acknowledge, but actually it's something we try and live by. Um, and if at any point you believe that someone has not been behaving uh, in OLS spaces or representing OLS uh, in line with the code of conduct, then please do let us know so that we can look into making sure this doesn't happen again whether this is something that you have witnessed or whether that's something you've experienced yourself. In order to report that, you can report uh, right now, line 46, email Paz, Berenice, Malvika, Emmy, or Yo at openlifesci.org. Or if you don't mind reaching the whole team, then team at openlifesci.org will reach all of us at once. Um, we have a transcript. That means that anything in the main room uh, is automatically picked up and converted into text, which can help people follow along for various different reasons. On my screen, if I want to view that, it's on the top left where it says Otto AI, click here to open live transcript. Um, it, it's worth noting though that in your uh, breakout rooms, which we will have one today, there is no Otto AI. And so instead what we offer is people can choose to have a written breakout room where you interact using the chat, or you can have a spoken breakout room, which is speaking like you and I are speaking right now. Um, so what I'm gonna do very briefly is just pause and ask for people to edit their Zoom display names. If you prefer S, uh, sorry, if you prefer spoken, please add S in front of your name. If you prefer written, please add W in front of your name. And that allows us to easily sort you into different breakout rooms when we get there. Um, and just to walk you through changing the name, um, I have clicked on the participants panel in my Zoom. And then beside my name, I can click on rename and then I can add W and S in front of my name. Choose whichever one works best for you. And if you're not sure, just pick one. Um, Okay, I can see most of you have done that. Thank you very much, my friends. And is there anything else in the intros? I think that's all of the intro stuff. So, <laughs> very good. I was, sorry, I'm getting distracted. Uh, I saw pre-review signing in and I thought, why is Daniela here? Um, but of course, it's actually Chad. And so I will actually be introducing our first speaker of the day in this case. So uh, we have Chad, who historically we knew from Mozilla, but now has a new and very exciting affiliation. Chad, do you want to take it from here? Sure. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, very, always very keen to, to come and hang out with the, the OLS crew. Um, as you said, my name is Chad Sansing. Uh, I'm currently the product manager at Pre-Review as of about 10 days ago. Very excited to help work on uh, furthering that platform's mission to become a, you know, in a very uh, inclusive infrastructure uh, for early career researchers and others who've been maybe historically marginalized from uh, the scientific and scholarly publication practices. So very happy to be there. Super excited to be working on that platform with that team. Prior to that, uh, I was at the Mozilla Foundation for uh, a number of years, uh, most recently as a program manager on the MozFest team, working on a number of community programs related both to the Mozilla Festival itself, and then also kind of like uh, the MozFest uh, Trustworthy AI Working Groups, uh, Open Leaders, when that program uh, was still running, uh, along with my fantastic colleague, Abby Cabanoff mays who I'll uh, whose work I'll, I'll cite throughout uh, my bit of a presentation here today. And way, way before that, I was a middle school teacher, so I taught 11 to 14-year-olds for uh, about a decade and a half, and that, uh, I think, probably more than anything else has informed how I work and think of things, even if I didn't quite have the same vocabulary to talk about it way back then. And today, we're going to talk about the, uh, the mountain of engagement, which is a, a methodology for kind of 
segmenting and better understanding what's going on in your community so that you can help support the things that are working for all your community members and maybe improve or get rid of the things that aren't quite returning value to anyone. Uh, and with that, I'll attempt to share my screen and begin. Are adults easier or harder to teach? I don't know. Uh, that's difficult. I didn't, you know, I didn't uh, approach my students like tiny versions of adults or anything like that. Uh, but I tried to approach them with a great deal of, uh, especially later in my careers, I kind of knew better, um, you know, equity and inquiry about what they wanted to do. Uh, and so I think if you do that, if you kind of connect uh, with folks' authentic needs and what they want to learn and accomplish with it, either way, whether it's kids or adults, it'll it'll turn out okay. All right, Mountain of Engagement, here we go. Uh, you can find my email here and at the end, as well as my Twitter handle for as long as I'll be on Twitter. Uh, doo, doo, doo. There we go. So can everybody see that? It's kind of like a circle now. Fantastic. So uh, the Mountain of Engagement, as I said, it's this methodology for better understanding kind of what's actually happening in your community so that you can, you know, discover and find what's not only valuable to your community members in terms of what they're getting from you, uh, but what they want to contribute back to your project. Uh, and it really helps kind of figure out where to pay attention, how to pay attention, what priorities might be, what might be things you can let go of, uh, because it's a way to really better understand what people are doing instead of um, engaging in sometimes what I feel is that uh, not necessarily a dead end or a trap, sometimes it works out, but it can be a very frustrating process to only ever go after the unicorn contributors who are willing and able to do everything that, let's say, a project founder is able to do. So this really helps kind of recognize and value more kinds of contributions and to think more creatively about how to give back to those making them. So that's a process of inviting and onboarding people, empowering them to take action once they're in your community, reviewing what's going on so that you can, again, recognize, appreciate, value, and support those folks, as well as, you know, show care when it's time for them to step back, take a break, whatever it is. Uh, and then to renew that process by, you know, maybe inviting folks to stay where they are, if they're super happy, maybe making uh, invitations really clear to take on a new role or some new responsibilities, if that's appealing to someone, or just to check in to see, you know, and notice that maybe you're not doing so much of this anymore. Would you like to try some of that? Are you taking a break? Uh, it can help with all these things. And uh, here uh, are a few things. Um, Abby wrote a terrific article in 2021 that I've linked to at the end of these slides, and we'll make sure everyone can have the link to these, uh, where you can find these graphics as well as more explanation. But really, in thinking about a mountain of engagement and creating these kind of virtuous loops of, of value between you and your community members and care and recognition, uh, the two pieces that are kind of the onboarding of newcomers to help them understand what you're all about, what's available, whether or not their values kind of align with yours, if it's a good match, and if there are opportunities for them to engage further if they'd like. And then a pathway, opportunities to kind of, you know, level up or become more involved or contribute a bit more, get back a bit more over time. So you can think of it as going from your first contact to more sustained engagement over time to leadership. And then, you know, uh, ideally in some models, uh, graduating, so to speak, from your community, maybe to, to start or to lead one of their own and, you know, to create uh, something, an offering that's a star for other people in the same constellation or ecosystem in which your community participates. You can see here, this is uh, maybe another way to break it down. If you want to be a little bit more granular, uh, you want to have, think through ways, you know, how do people uh, discover what it is that we're doing? And this might be something, you know, you set up and you refresh periodically, maybe not where you put you know, all of your effort if you're a more mature project, but maybe it's where you put a lot of effort when you begin. Uh, first contact, what happens when people reach out? Who's paying attention to that? Who is sharing back uh, information or invitations? Then folks have a chance to participate. Maybe they attend a virtual event. Maybe they contribute to one particular project or a piece of software or something like that. And if it really works for them, uh, maybe they keep, you know, they come back again and again. And then over time, they help you and you help them connect with folks doing similar work across projects until they're in kind of like a leadership role, you know, taking responsibility for part of the project they feel really passionate about. Um, and then again, like I said, perhaps even, you know, developing something complementary uh, of their own and beginning that and becoming, you know, another star in that constellation to which you belong. So uh, in this graphic, Abby has given lots of different examples. These are kind of particular, I think, to her role as the lead for kind of open maintainers at GitHub right now. Um, but you can see 
she thought through different ways people might discover some of that work. Uh, maybe it's a, uh, an article or a repository or a notebook somewhere online that's useful to them. Could be a little bit of marketing or outreach. Uh, that open source license might be something very inviting. Oh, here's something I care about and they're welcoming my contribution and I can share it, I can use it back. You can kind of provide information at the beginning that might hint at some of the value to come later on. And then in terms of that first contact, being able to respond and to just talk with people about how your values align, uh, being in the different communication channels where other community members are might be a good way to find more people. Having a really clear readme or uh, a compact or a charter or something like that, the folks again can use to kind of confirm their alignment with you. And then throughout participation, sustained participation, network participation, you know, the, they get introduced to the workflows, the processes, the codes of conduct, or community participation guidelines, or um, I don't know, maybe governance structures in which at first they can participate and maybe over time take an interest in leading. Um, but as you know, participation becomes more sustained, um, figuring out, you know, what does it take to really help people stick with you, stick with your project, stay in your community. Um, what are triggers for folks leaving that you want to avoid or, you know, when folks do leave, uh, if it's for, you know, a fantastic reason, how do you make that kind of like a celebratory uh, moment, something like that. Uh, and then connecting them to folks out elsewhere in the network participation piece who maybe have helped you or, or you have helped to continue their professional development and uh, maybe uh, events where folks from lots of different communities, communities uh, with aligned interests come together. Maybe you call your hackathons a, a sprint or a jam, something less competitive, but other social events as well could work there. And then leadership, you know, making that personal invite, um, that personal recognition. You know, we've noticed all you've done. Are you interested in this new oh, opportunity coming up? There's a, there's a console for everybody. Um, and getting them into maybe some governance roles, maybe really how, uh, getting them into shaping that value exchange at the the high end of community contributions where it can sometimes be difficult to know exactly what to do is to make sure you're not you know, exploiting someone's labor. Um, they can help you figure those things out. So that mountain of engagement and with all the different conversations, you know, there's a bit of planning, there's a bit of hypothesis, uh, you know, composing hypotheses in there. Uh, there's some testing, it all comes down to really talking with the folks in your community. What made you go from this kind of contribution to this? What made you step back? Why'd you come back? Um, are you willing to reach out to others? A lot of conversation, almost like user research that you would do in designing a program or an event or anything like that. I think there's just an awful lot of um, you know, interconnectedness between product, community, and program management. Um, but these can also be you know, matrices of people and their stories and giving people opportunities to share their stories with others that might be you know, inspiring or illustrative of how to make an impact uh, in your community and in the fields that they really care about. Uh, it's an opportunity for you know, you to infuse all of what you're doing with your values, you know, how does a workflow reflect a value? These are good questions to ask. Um, behaviors, you know, what kind of behaviors do we expect? Do we not expect? Those things can be part of it. Um, people can be drawn to your community because, you know, the exemplary behaviors there are so welcoming, or so professional, or so helpful. Um, it's folks' contribution, like I said. You kind of want to uh, maybe segment things and to think about how people, you know, start off with you, how they grow with you, what do they do when they're ready to go, thinking about your leadership and your learning opportunities, not just for community members, but also for yourself in helping those community members along and pursuing their interest in the context of your community. Professional development opportunities, likewise, for them and for you. Uh, you've got those wonderful stories, another opportunity for user research. Um, decision making, right? Thinking through your own decision making. Is that always uh, what kind of governance do you have? How can that process be improved with the input of people at different levels of your mountain or, you know, dare we say, matrix of engagement? Um, and really thinking through the value exchanges, whether they are uh, fiscal in nature uh, or, you know, other resources are at play. Um, there, I think there often can be within a mountain of engagement lots of opportunities to think through how do we fairly equitably recognize, compensate, lift up this work, this person? Um, and it can change over time as your organization or your project matures, but always bears thinking about. And the more you think about it, the more creative you are, and the more you involve the people who are making the contributions, I think the better and better those can be. So one way to begin this, you know, very practically, and you can find more in the, in the resources at the end here, um, is to list all the ways you can think of that people engage with your project, whether it's very light touch or very heavy touch. 
then to maybe group those different kinds of engagements into bands of engagements that are alike. These are all things folks might do at the beginning. These are all intermediate contributions. These are all advanced or leadership level contributions. Whatever makes sense to you, just try to start grouping them together into different bands. Start thinking about what's the current value exchange in each band? Why are people doing this? What are they giving? What are they getting back? Talk with them about whether that you know, seems uh, equitable or not, how it could be improved or changed. Begin observing how people move between the bands or how they stand still. And again, talk with them about why, you know, find out what's motivating you here, whether it's to kind of like move up towards a leadership position or it's to, you know, step back. Um, maybe if they're not returning to contribute to a project, they're evangelizing it or bringing new people in and that's not something visible to you yet. So again, talking to folks really important at every step. Then you can revise your assumptions with everything you're kind of discovering about your contributors, the nature of their work, the value exchange, uh, whether they're kind of looking inward to be kind of almost like, um, you know, individual contributors to whatever it is you might be building together, or whether they're looking outward to attract more people to the community. And just keep experimenting and iterating on that mountain to really care for and sustain the people who are there with you and the ways that they want to participate. And you might find that, you know, a lot of the um, the action or the heat that's happening isn't necessarily at the you know highly know, most technical level or in governance, but it's somewhere else where community members' contributions really allow you to uh, trust and delegate and work with and collaborate with, and you know you have a little now extra space for other project members to maybe look at something else that is also pressing or urgent. Once you have kind of a mountain of engagement set up, you can start to discover these things, whether you do it, think of it as little segmentation or user research. Um, it's just a looping process that can really help you uh, create space uh, for all uh, in your community. Final thoughts, uh, this is very holistic. I think you can do it with just about every part of a project. Um, you know, figure out by talking with people how they interact with things like the code of conduct or the workflows or the governance. Um, remember it's driven by not just kind of like the value exchanges, but also the value of a project that can really attract people and communicating that throughout the entire mountain is important, you know, just as important at the beginning as at the, not necessarily the end, but, uh, you know, further along, whatever form that takes. Remember those ethics of, of care and remembering care, recognition, acknowledgement, uh, all of those things, uh, helping people, uh, you know, sustain their relationship with your work or your field. Uh, it's very important. I think this can scale up and down orgs and communities, like I said, at different levels of engagement. Um, do think about, you know, different kinds of roles for people who might be coming back to contribute more versus those who are maybe going out further into the world, but pointing folks back in your direction. Um, I think there's a lot here, again, uh, overlap between community project and product management and just, um, you know, kind of rigorous uh, uh, processes of talking with people. Again, most important part. Um, you might collect some data during this time. Be really mindful about how you do that, who has access to it, where it lives, things like that. Not a lawyer, but perhaps check with one. Um, share what you learn. Uh, I think it was a lot of fun for, for Abby and I to, to share and to, to kind of um, hand off different parts of the program when we ran it, but also to see so many programs continue on after Mozilla's version of Open Leaders. And just you know, remember that cycle, discovery, hypothesizing, testing with people, revising, releasing, and you know, doing it all over again. Might have been a little more than 10 minutes, so I'll thank you for your patience um, as well as your just being here today with the OLS. And I'll stop screen sharing and perhaps open it up for questions. Chad, that was so profoundly soothing. And like, I, 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 I've okay. listened to this talk <laughs> so many times and I still learn new things. And it's like, yeah, I, I don't even care if it's going over time, which is probably terrible, but I just want to listen to some more. <laughs> we, can do, we can do shorter questions and folks can follow up with me just to make sure there's time for everybody else as well. But if there are any immediate questions. Uh, so folks, if you want to unmute. We are good in time, by the way. Um, oh. And we, we also left more time at the end for, because yeah, sometimes people, you know, take time to process the question. Absolutely. Um, so. This is why we should always have a pause. She always has our time sorted. Um, folks, uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to unmute, feel free to type them in the chat, or feel free to add them in the etherpad. Line 73 is the place to put those.
I'm also going to add uh, just next to Abby's article case study that I did that I did not show in the slides, but is in the slides. There it is. Okay, there's one coming through. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll try not to make them too nervous by, by reading as they type, because uh, that, that, that's Same, always uh, stress-inducing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have two. Okay, first one. Um, what things have gone wrong in the past trying to implement these processes with people, um, or what type of resistance might be a better way of phrasing that? Yeah. So I can think of a couple of maybe concrete examples of, uh, you know, the anonymized th things that, that went wrong. But, you know, um, sometimes in setting up um, programs like this or onboarding folks or getting them used to workflows, um, you know, we, when we were running uh, open leaders, we would sometimes experience mismatches between, let's say, like mentors and mentees. And um, you have to kind of like pay attention, sometimes very direct messaging, hey, so-and-so is not showing up, or hey, so-and-so's tone is, or hey, so-and-so is not being very helpful. And we could uh, go in there and kind of talk to each party separately and try to find some consensus. And sometimes we had to pick up on more, you know, um, subtle critiques of one party or another. Similarly, go in there and say, you know, begin with maybe more subtle questions. How are things going? Is there anything, you know, what's going well? What's not going well? Is there anything you wish you would change? You know, questions you might find very similar to the ones at the end of this document and to try to go from there. Uh, and when the mismatch just wasn't something that would be able to be resolved or it wasn't really in one party's best interest or the other, or if there was ever a risk of, you know, harm, um, you know, find find a new mentor for the mentees, essentially, uh, or if there was something in the mentee's behavior to address, you know, address that according to uh, what we had said we would do with our code of conduct. Um, occasionally, you know, time, some people would um, be like, oh, you know, this this is taking much more time than I thought it would. Or, uh, and that could be very realistic, sometimes impressions of that, you know, someone might join a project, be very interested, and they need a little bit more coaching and mentoring to get over something like, you know, imposter syndrome, or to, to really kind of like open up and give their honest feedback. And in those cases where people kind of wanted to be there, weren't quite sure how, or maybe a bit insecure about how, relationship building, personal invitation, um, more conversations one-on-one -on -one than in group settings, I think were, were good to use there. Um, and then just another challenge was thinking through um, a good challenge to have kind of like the, whether it was open leaders or other projects, you know, helping people think through kind of like equity of opportunity along things like um, things that the pandemic have had us, you know, confront even more directly in terms of like geography, temporal geography. Um, you know, are we always meeting at one time on one date? Is that disadvantaging one group of people because of, you know, perhaps where they live in the world or, uh, their daily schedule or their ways that we can offer uh, the same thing at different times on different days and um, what kind of capacity do we do we have to do that as like a leadership group or as a group of you know consistent volunteers you know who can we draw on who might be willing and able from the community to take on some logistical leadership organizational work and you know how do we compensate them so um, that temporal and geographical difficulty that's really uh, always has been there, uh, has maybe been more pronounced to, to some people during the pandemic as something to, to deal with. And then as you think about, you know, what is our capacity for addressing that? If you're going to invite community members to help you with that, how do you adequately compensate them? It can be a challenge for sure, especially early on in, in a project and its maturity when things are maybe a little more mission driven or altruistic or, um, you know, driven by uh, forms of value exchange that are different than, than fiscal, even though they might mature into that. That's a really good segue, Chad, into the next question, which is when we are a young opportunity, when we are a young organization um, and we're trying to gain users and community members, any tips? Mm -hmm. Because you can't really build a pathway for yeah. nobody. Have have your own clarity. So whether you work, you're probably working through something like a project canvas and coming up with a really clear readme and things that will help those first folks who kind of um, want to know more uh, kind of really trust you in your processes, such as a strong, uh, you know, set of community participation guidelines, you know, being prepared, making specific asks. So like, we know these are the things that are most pressing right now. And we as a team of two or three are going to try to get them done, but we'd love some help asking for those things in particular. 
and maybe a couple of things that are related to those things or, you know, tangential and orbit around them can be something good to do. Very specific asks. And then having an idea of where maybe you'd like to be in a month, a couple of months, a half year, so that if somebody comes to you and wants to contribute and uh, you, know, you think it'd be a good fit, values are aligned, but you really need something different right now, your first contact isn't about saying no. It's about saying um, yes, and we'll be ready for that con of contribution in 30 days, in four weeks, in six weeks, something like that. So having ways to say yes early on, that can be time boxed a little bit further down the road. And, you know, in the meantime, you know, subscribe to the newsletter or, you know, follow the GitHub repo or wh wherever it is you're doing work, join the Slack channel, uh, you know, join the Mattermost, join the Mastodon, whatever it is. Um, keep them engaged somehow until that yes is triggered by your being ready to accept their help. Thank you so much, Chad. And thank you to everyone who's added some of these really good questions uh, into the document. We're really grateful also to Magic Note Taker. We're grateful to you too. Um, Chad, I think we're going to move on to the next yeah. speaker. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Thanks, everyone. Uh, oh, no, not next speaker, but the next. Um, oh, yeah. Let's, let's do one final. Yeah. Be, be at the Thanks. rock concert. Scream. Great to be here with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Paz, over to you. You're, you're next. Yes. So we are going to do some breakout, breakout room discussion. Uh, so uh, in line, go to line 90 in the other part. And we're going to ask you to reflect on the following, which is what are you giving to your community or organization or project? And what is it giving back? What are the gaps? How might you close those gaps? And choose two or three of the prompts there, like what kinds of things uh, do you give to others in your open leadership practices uh, or you would like to? What kinds of things do you do get back? And does balance seem right to you or not? What adjustments would you make? Um, choose, uh, two or three of those there are extra ones uh, in line 95 and and yeah i think are we ready to go to the yeah you're being sent As you want to do the follow up from the breakout, we have some time for insights. Um, okay, so um, I can see a lot of notes in the pad, so that's very cool. Um, who wants to share um, what they discussed? Uh, uh, go ahead. I mean, Aman, do you want <laughs> to start? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I can do that. Uh, so uh, Jennifer, I, and Paz were in the breakout room, and like initially we were discussing uh, the regular giving back in to the community in terms of say code contributions and doing stuff for the project and getting back in terms of say the community itself and the upskilling that you gain. Uh, but Paz brought in a very interesting point, which I haven't thought a lot about before. Is uh, like how do we encourage communities to document processes other than the documentation of the project itself so we know that projects have documentation in different forms uh, say regarding different uh, logistics of the project say if it's code it's content there is but we do not have documentation like how did they grow the project or how did they find new team members how did they get their funding and like that could actually be a very pretty useful resource for communities to refer to. And I think one downside that we realized to it, yeah, community metadata, that would be great. Uh, but yeah, one downside would be, again, it actually requires people to work extra. So there is that extra labor, especially if it's a voluntary project. But yeah, uh, that, that was quite insightful. And now it has got me thinking that especially uh, at at a place like OLS when we have so many potential uh, communities and projects, that might be a good thing to keep in mind. So 
however much we can do that in our own capacities would be nice, I guess. And sort of just to make a point that, yeah, we can do it, especially while incubating communities, because from what I can remember, we've always seen sort of those reflective blogs and stories when people are trying to think that, yeah, how did we make this happen or what exactly we did, but there's never this active documentation around the community, not that I know of, at least. So yeah, I think that was more or less it. Uh, feel free to add something if I missed anything first. Perfect. Do you want to ask someone else to share? <laughs> oh, no. Volunteer, please. Someone else. Don't need to show your face, by the way. You can only be, you can also just be boys. If not, uh, yeah, I was thinking that I can read a few ones. So the first one was Tamin, Melissa, and Emma. A cool axolot. <laughs> that was the name of the group. Um, about giving to the community, uh, what are the technical barriers to make open source contributions? I would say, First is understanding GitHub can be quite intimidating the first time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, no, I shouldn't have read that. I mean, I should have read the other thing, like giving back to the community, giving to the community, opportunities to make first open source contributions, a structure and organization to pursue, to pursue own interests. Um, and not one challenging thing they said uh, is to find the balance between the participation of community organizers and other types of community roles. How not to leave too much uh, in the hands of organizers? Uh, yeah, that is a good question. Um, yeah. Uh, do we have time or do we go to the next thing? I'm lost now with the time. I think we probably need to move on. Okay. Well, I would just say that um, it looks very interesting, like very, there's a lot of things here. So do take a look um, after the call if you can, so you don't forget. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, Batul is going to present the next talk. Yeah, thank you so much, Paz. Uh, thank you. So I'm very, very excited and delighted to introduce Melissa, who's going to speak about personas and pathways. Over to Melissa, you can share when you're comfortable to. Yeah, hi everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and thank you for this great opportunity. This is such a this is such a welcoming community. And uh, I'm not gonna be looking at the chat. So if there are any questions there, I will have to catch up after my presentation. Okay, let me go ahead and share the screen. Do you see like a the cover of a presentation okay yep. great all right uh so yeah now it showed me a message that you can see so i'm melissa i'm joining you from brazil uh, i'm a light-skinned and dark haired woman in her 30s and i'm wearing black famed eyeglasses and headphones my background is just so white wall with a bit of a shadow from a lamp here to, to my left um, so we're here to chat, to chat today about uh, community design for inclusivity, right? Which has something very precious behind and sustaining it, which is people. Or here I played a little bit with this translation, personas, uh, pessoas in Portuguese, my native uh, language. Uh, but it will also be talking about personas in a way to understand the users of your product or the people who are participating in your community. Um, so we will also talk about contributor personas and this was just playing with the, the tr translation. So a bit of my professional journey here, uh, for example, communities uh, were key to drive me to these places where I am today and where I've been in the past. I feel very happy collaborating now with some of the communities shown in this slide. Um, well, my academic background is actually in geography, but I was a researcher on software technology and society. 
And then eventually I became a member of open source software and open science communities of practice. So I believe that that journey happened because of uh, the people I met uh, along the way. And so I come you know, from the University of Sao Paulo here in Brazil, then I had some time at uh, UCLA in the United States. I was a mentee at Outreach and now becoming a mentor again with Batul. Uh, and then worked with these projects, EDAM, CWL, as a community engineer too. And I'm currently the infrastructure and impact measurement coordinator at Metadocencia, an organization that I will be referring to very much during this presentation. Uh, we at Metadocencia build mostly workshops uh, for evidence-based teaching practices and also open science. A bit of bioinformatics is coming up, a bit of ethics in AI is coming up. Um, I'm also the organization admin for uh, OBF at Google Summer of Code. I participate uh, in the NASA TOPS initiative and also this really cute uh, illustration here from the Turing Way uh, translation and localization team with Batul and Andrea and others that are here. And so, yeah, uh, I think this is just, it's not to say that, oh my God, look at all that I'm doing, but to see, to say that these, uh, these models of participation in these different communities uh, really changes in a way and change our pathways as well. Well, I know that this community really likes cute animals, so I had to put something in the presentation. <laughs> so there are some little ducklings, a community of little ducklings. Um, so, so many communities are out there for everything, right? Why would we want to be a part of that? Uh, well, you can share goals and interests that could be, if you like, I don't know, chinchillas wearing hats, you know, could be anything, if you like ducklings. But we're, we're talking mostly about science here. So in this case, uh, in science specifically, it's really interesting how communities can be uh, beneficial for collaboration, for creating opportunities. Some examples are uh, hackathons where many projects are born. The CWL project that I just mentioned, Common Workflow Language, was born out of a hackathon. Uh, with open resources, these bonds built in these spaces, they continue and they flourish, right? Especially now in, in this world where open source projects are done in a lot of in a lot of cases remotely. So it's important to have open resources to sustain this participation, right? Uh, peer support, of course, to uh, continue, you know, to move on, because sometimes it's so hard to go alone. Uh, representation and visibility, that's really important for marginalized folks, especially uh, in the case of science, for example, decolonizing it, promoting ethical ways of doing research, that is very important for that. Um, well, many uh, communities historically have been also based on uh, shared interests in politics or in doing agency for a political cause. That includes power relations in science too, of course. So it's important to uh, share knowledge among the participants and even find ways to protect themselves, you know, and uh, create mutual learning out of this shared experience. And of course, friendship, right? <laughs> That's one of the coolest things that come out of community participation. Well, the idea of personas that are kind of like at the core of this whole conversation about community and their pathways or caminos here to play with the Spanish, right? Uh, is more often used in design and to understand the user, you know, UI, UX, and to work with a specific audience in mind. Uh, so what are we working for exactly? Who are we talking to? What is the audience of this project? Uh, so to plan to create content that will speak to that audience, to create empathy with a certain group, understanding their needs, their interests, which, uh, as the last slide here says, will change over time. They aren't static. They change people, change their interests, change the community involves as a this big amalgam of things too. Uh, and all of these uh, help us build project design for inclusivity, uh, whether it is a design a UI UX project or a scientific project, right? 
So uh, at Metalocencia, we actually had an exercise personas on personas about a couple of weeks ago. So I want to thank them uh, uh, for that, for all the, the, the experiences and discussions we shared. And uh, that was at a series of governance meetings we had with 10 of, of the team members. But uh, this had been uh, a part of Metatosensis learning strategies in the workshops that we teach for a while now. So there's this website, there, there's this page in our website about the personas. And these are some of the ones that are available now. Uh, there, there are more that are being added right now that we're updating. Uh, but basically, the idea is to try to have these imaginary folks in mind that we build a workshop or workshops with them in mind, right? So if you have a different type of scientific project, that could be, um, you know, a different kind of approach to that. But in the case of Metadocencia, we are a very uh, Latin America-based community, so we did look for resources. Uh, uh, such as the UNESCO report on education in Latin America. So we're speaking to people that um, come from societies where there is a lot of inequality, where identity and origin will shape their opportunities in education, where there are many mechanisms of discrimination, stigmatization that may come into play. And so uh, this was a huge thing to talk about personas in our community, just to give an example of a real case where we did talk about this. Um, so how do we even find out who these personas are, right? Uh, well, their demographics are maybe one of the first things that come to mind. So kind of like describing really this imaginary person. And it's such an interesting uh, creative exercise. You start reflectioning on reflecting on your own experiences, on people you know, on, on how you wish things were, how you wish they were different, how wish they were like sometime you saw in the past. So you start thinking of their pain points, their expectations. You uh, start thinking about their motivations and preferences and situations they've been through. Oh, hello, cat. <laughs> and then um, in order to to kind of organize the, these thoughts better, we worked with a tool called Persona Canvas. Uh, we found this from this organization called Design a Better B Business. So this little template is available there. We translated it into Spanish and modified a little bit because the license allowed us to do that. Um, but yeah, the idea was to, to really do a collective exercise on this and then share. Uh, some trends that we saw in, in these characteristics, we came up with a, a number of new personas uh, with some shared characteristics. And one very interesting one that came up a lot of times out of this exercise was that uh, people, you know, the personas we created, many of them needed more time to do things. They found that they were very busy. Uh, so I think that reflects a lot these this, these times of remote work, you know, and participating in so many projects. With this, I want to make a point also about uh, how if you're participating in a, in a bunch of communities, you don't need to be a leader in all of them, right? Uh, we have a limited time to live our lives and to contribute with communities. It's okay to have different roles in different communities and to expect that from the participants in your community. So of course, Chad gave us an awesome talk on mountain of engagement. So I won't uh, be uh, talking too long about this, but this is another model uh, from the Mozilla Open Leaders Leadership Training that is uh, this pathway, the, the personal pathway, right? So that involves, I don't think I have a lot of time to talk about this now, but uh, it's the, this idea that every person in your community has a story, right? So they find out here about the project, could be in social media or something like that, or through someone that talked to them about it. Then the first interaction, participation, sustaining it, and then starting to collaborate in certain ways, sort of like uh, branching out in different ways to participate. And eventually some of the, those folks will become leaders in projects and sub-projects. Um, at Matadocesa, again, one interesting story that we had was of people that 
took the workshops and then eventually became workshop organizers or even building new workshops. So that's like a, a star story, right? But not everybody has to be like that either. It's just an example. Well, how then to stay engaged and go further, right? Um, I think one way to, to think about this is what stories we know in the communities we're a part of. So like this one I just told about a member of the Metal Sensei community, uh, how we're building and sustaining shared values. This requires a lot of chatting, building activities together. This requires a bit of vulnerability too, to share what you believe in, to share situations you've been through. And how does the community change them and how do they shape the community as well? I think that's a, a nice way to see it because uh, I, it's like a living being, right? Yeah, that is all the time being molded by itself. Um, yeah, I brought the dogs again because they're like flying to new adventures now after growing up a little bit. I think this is what I had to share now. I'm sorry if I went over time a little bit. There you have my my contacts again, and I'm curious to hear what questions you have. Thank you. Wow, uh, thank you so much, Melissa. This is very insightful. Yeah, um, and very inspiring as well. Uh, if you have any question for Melissa, please do type it in the chat, uh, or you can write it in the other badge. Uh, we actually have now a couple of questions, so I'm going to go through them. Um, so one question is asking, you mentioned that you do update these personas in your community. How often do you update them and do you have specific approach when you update the personas? Yeah, uh, Metodo Sensei is about two years old now, two and a half years old now. It started uh, right at the wake of the pandemic, actually, to try to help teachers with remote uh, activities. And so we this is the first update on personas as a whole. So two and a half years later, because we did identify that the project uh, didn't have to be as connected to remote learning and pandemic lockdown situations anymore, because you know teachers are starting to, to give uh, uh, hybrid classes now. But there is one thing too. Uh, there are many workshops being built and update right, updated right now, but that's not like we only update them right now, right? That could be at any point in time. At the moment that a workshop is updated, the personas are also reviewed because they are they are built or updated with a persona or a group of personas in mind. So that's I guess the the best moments is when you're writing. A curriculum and you're like okay so who are we talking to then you go back and see if you want to change it, anything that's taking me actually to the second question do you get inspired by real people when you draw these personas oh yeah 100 percent. yes uh i mean it spoke very much to in this case of my community it spoke very much to the group of people that were involved in that so our our teammates basically uh but yeah we also something interesting that i'm remembering we did was that we some of the people during this persona exercise thought of communities instead of like a persona but that was a community so for example i remember i came up with something like a an open science community in ecuador something like that because I guess I had my memories of seeing this in events on social media, uh, these communities pop up. And yeah, I think it's it's hard to, to take things out of your head out of nowhere. I think our memory plays a little bit with us in that sense. Well, yeah, I'd say that's it. <laughs> and thank you, Melissa, for a very elaborate uh response as you can move to the last question if you have time um sure uh, so have you found that the use of these personas made you more self-aware regarding the role that you play within your community yeah i think so yeah because well we are kind of like unintentionally biased many times right when we're 
building resources, when we are communicating. And so having the personas in mind as a resource and having it written down somewhere published also helps uh, you not have to, to have that all in your head and have a place to consult that often is really interesting. And when you build these collaboratively, uh, even if your project only has a couple people working on it, right? It's, it's okay, of course. Uh, I think you you get to hear different approaches. That's the that's a very interesting aspect of having diversity and inclusion in a community. And I know there's going to be a future lesson on that in, in the cohort. So I hope you remember this. Uh, that the more brains you have thinking together, I think the more interesting outcomes you can have because you you might not be thinking of that other thing that the other person brought up. Uh, yeah. 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 These are really profound thoughts, Melissa. Um, yeah. There is many things that we take for granted. Thank you so much. Um, uh, if you have any more questions for Melissa, feel free to add them to the upper bars and maybe she can answer them inside the upper bars, but just for the sake a bit conscious of the time, so um, we're going to move to the next speaker, which is going to be introduced by Emma. Over to you. Thank you, Vatul, and thanks, everyone. Um, Melissa, it was a, a great talk. Thank you so much for all these insights. So our next speaker is Jeff. He's one of the co-founders of Public Lab, which is an organization working on environmental sciences and providing a community um, around all, all these. And he's also been serving in the board of the Open Source Hardware Association. And yeah, I don't want to introduce him much more. I think um, I hand over the word to you because we are a bit tight on time. So I want to make sure there is time for questions. But thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to present the uh, screen. Um, um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, yeah, I can't see the chat. So again, maybe feel free to like interrupt or wave or something. Um, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk on, on two different things. So I might run out of time and that's cool. I can just talk about things in, in chat after feel free to reach out to me. The first one was, um, yeah, I can give like a little bit of overview on public lab, but but honestly, I, I think uh, it's it's sort of its own thing. So I'm, I'm just gonna kind of breeze through it a little bit, but it's like um, a public lab, uh, it was started like after the BP oil spill and, and it's been an open source community focused on measuring um, environmental harms uh, uh, and injustices um, using open source and, and uh, do-it-yourself techniques. So taking aerial photos of a, a oil spill or a brownfield site, a contaminated area, trying to measure uh, soils or water um, and do analysis ourselves um, and, uh, and is kind of, I don't know, one of the main kind of drivers behind the, the term community science um, uh, as opposed to citizen science. So community science being a science which is uh, centered in a community uh, and, and not uh, in an institution which seeks to work work with the community. So it sort of often can have some of the same actors like um, formal scientists and people experiencing you know, environmental harms. But in the citizen science, the, the institution maybe tries to engage the public, but the institution's at the center. And in community science, that is inverted. Um, so, uh, okay, but so, uh, software and community and, and doing it together and um, and identity, I think, I, like one thing that is interesting. Um, so, okay, wait, take a step back. I, I've led the public lab software community for many years. And um, one thing that's kind of interesting about it is that it operates, um, Kind of in parallel to the rest of the public lab community and we have somewhat different processes um but uh but the two learn from each other as well um but i i, I wanted to give a kind of a a quick um view into how we engage people how we uh, welcome people into our software community 
and and then go back and reflect on hardware and and um, and how that might affect things like environmental measurement or something. So I'll start here and. Uh, so I'm one of the I'm lead code code community uh, code community coordinator uh, along with uh, til uh, Tilda and Sass. I should share Twitter handles too, although maybe that will all just be gone briefly and then nobody will care. Uh, but anyway, um, and this is kind of our welcoming page. So if it's code.publiclab.org, um, and and you arrive and we're you know we got a lot of info we want to share with you, but essentially we want to let people know that we're here to help you try something out, help someone else out. And then the third one, which maybe is a little different, uh, is to help welcome someone else in. And that is really fundamental to our approach. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to just go through it a bit. Like the, the background of it is maybe what, uh, eight years ago, um, it felt like we had like essentially one or two people writing code and no ability to write new code that we needed as a community. And we were like always, yeah, it felt like there was a shortage of capacity. Um, and then it felt like we were trapped. Like how do we use our capacity to be inclusive versus like getting, using the limited capacity to get something done. That's sort of a, um, yeah, definitely the wrong question. And by embracing a different way of thinking about things, our community grew a great deal. And I wanna really note that it wasn't just that there was a larger group of people, but that we had to accept that the code had to change. We had to write different software and it had to be stru structurally different for this to work. And it had to be better. It had to be informed by different perspectives. Uh, which is the sort of typical diversity, you know, that's what diversity is all about. But I actually think it's something far, far more fundamental that um, we're not just like making code easier or like more readable or more legible. We're actually writing code that does different things. It's structured differently. Uh, there's very fundamental ways that the project was transformed by the interest in working with other people with making a good experience and a welcoming experience. Um, so I think, uh, you know, there is this idea, you, you can definitely recognize gaps in understanding and experience that, that could be uh, addressed through a different body of contributors. Um, but, but I think you have to, we have to really fundamentally understand that we're not just sort of doing stuff around the periphery of a project. Uh, by, uh, you know, a few years into this transformation for us, when we thought of a new project or we thought of a new thing we wanted to do, uh, we were already breaking it down into pieces that looked fundamentally different from how they might've looked just a few years earlier. Uh, and, and this is a bit of an overwhelming diagram, but part of it is just to show that when we tried to map out, like Sess and I made this the first version of this on paper, like at the Google um, Summer of Code Mentor Summit, like a few years ago. And we were just like, what are all the different things that we do to like make this a welcoming place? And we were like, well, we do this. We, we had this one script. We like set up this bot that like responds to comments. We like always say this phrase. Um, we have this like a group of people that does this thing and it got really overwhelming, but we tried to organize it a little bit uh, so we could see where do people find us? Where's their first point of contact? Um, it'll make more sense later. I'm not gonna actually review every point in this diagram, but we tried to then sort of break it down into a bunch of different zones and you can read about this in depth at this address below um where we've tried to document it, it it's it is kind of a mess but we're doing our best um the center of everything is welcoming newcomers nothing in our community happens without it there's no portion of the code the only reason code is not um open to newcomers is because it's poorly written and because it's like a mess and we're, we're about to, we're, and we, we want to throw it away or we want to reform it and it's terrible. Like good code is code that um, someone can walk into and experience as a, as, a, as a place, like as a community and where there's a sense that you belong there, right? So um, you have to think about welcoming newcomers into every portion of the process if you can. Um, and that takes a lot of, takes a lot of work. And, and it takes a lot of activity. So I think like going way back the very beginning, and this is like the, you know, 10 years ago, people thought this is like the entirety of uh, inclusivity or of like welcoming or something, but it has to be like almost immediately start up 
the code, obviously, um, and it is surprisingly humbling how hard it is to get to an experience that's just like click a button and the whole thing is running. Um, so I'm not even going to talk about that. That's its own thing. But 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 there are so many projects that are like, oh, it takes like a few hours or it takes a few days to get it running. So anyway, and then of course a code of conduct. There's there's essentially nothing else as important as making sure that people feel safe from the very first moment they're in a space and that that code of conduct is not just fine print, but that it's it's communicated, it's highly visible. And it's not just that you aren't gonna get hurt, it's that people are actively compassionate and respectful. And it's, it's basically any opportunity to share a sense of that, even through the tone of your language, in the first few moments as the, when someone comes in is very powerful. It's kind of like the, um, yeah, like you get a look at a, a restaurant as you walk in the door, you're like, is this place friendly? Is it for me? Or maybe not a restaurant, something like that. You know what I mean? Um, so highly visible. Uh, and then to make that, you know, safety, trust, respect, be part of the identity of your community. And then finally, I'll just, I won't dwell too much on it, but quick, decisive, transparent action against anything that interrupts this is really fundamental. Uh, and I thought a bit about like, what does this allow? Because I remember there was a period where there were like some, you know, like you have these like cranky people and then actually that's just code for saying that they're toxic because, um, um, you know, you, people think, oh, that's just a cranky person. But actually that's, they're really a fundamental problem to the community. It's not just crankiness. Once you get that out of the way, like you have to do a lot of work. You have to like come up with like a committee to like review what was wrong. And then, you know, all this stuff, all this work has to happen to deal with the toxicity. But there is a point where you have established a baseline, which is non-toxic or relatively non-toxic, a friendlier baseline, a newer, healthier baseline. Once you do that, you gain all the time back. I think you gain a huge amount of capacity because you're not chasing all of this just wildly problematic stuff happening everywhere. People aren't feeling bad about themselves the same way. So you gain a lot of ability to do stuff as a community. And so I think that's an interesting thing that people, sometimes people think that enforcing a code of conduct is mostly just work you have to do. Uh, and I think that once you create a space where it is effectively the norm, and that doesn't mean you can stop worrying about it, but it, you know, but you want your community to not have to worry about it so that they can focus on doing stuff and caring about each other. Um, so, okay, uh, friendliness, I think uh, going overboard with friendliness can backfire occasionally, but it's pretty tough, especially like, it's pretty tough for there to be too many emoji. Um, there are accessibility considerations, like repeating one emoji forever is something I used to do. And I have stopped doing it as much because then like screen readers will just read it. Um, and okay, I learned that. Um, but yeah, we use a lot of smileys. We celebrate like even just things that are a little weird to like, why am I, you know, like, hooray. Um, but but yeah, it's like that setting the tone really early and quickly. Um, uh, I did also change my icon, so I'm no longer like a scary monkey. Uh, so that that also helped. Uh, but um, yeah, and so we get these messages all the time in our community where people are like, hello, like I'm, I'm interested, like, and you just, you know, and it's usually, these days it's not even me doing it, but like this is like when I took the screenshots, like don't want to put someone else on the spot. Um, and uh, yeah, using like a lot of, I don't know why I used a lion there, but um, I guess I was like feeling effusive. Um, okay, and then in terms of methods, specific things that we, or like <clears throat> processes, first timers only was uh, started by other folks. Like there's first timer, first timers.net, I think. I mean, there's a bunch of people doing first timers only as a, as a methodology and hoodie is a great community. I don't even know if they exist anymore, but we learned it from them. Uh, here's one of the websites we originally founded on. But one thing that's really interesting about making a first timers only issue and that people don't often get at the beginning is that it takes much longer to make this issue than to solve the problem. In fact, it, it takes like 10 times longer. And it's because your goal is not even to fix the issue or to do what you're trying to build, start a relationship. So you gotta like really tune this and we've done even better. This is like an old screenshot. I think we do better now even at like not too much upfront and we have little sections that expand, you know, really, really, really getting this down where 
you're guiding someone to do something and you're literally just telling them every single step and you're there for them. You're, they're not, they don't even have to come up with a new solution. That's later. This is an experience of going through the steps with a guide so that you know what it's like and being encouraged along the way, which, which counts for a lot. So, I mean, ours actually often have like a diff. It's like remove these lines and then add these lines. Like it's just word for word, exactly what you do. Um, don't give too much context. You know, it's nice to know, oh, it's gonna contribute to this email system. That's great, but you don't wanna overwhelm. Make sure that people can feel oriented with just enough context around what they're doing um, so that they feel like they have agency, you know? Uh, a clear description of what's wrong and what should be like before and after, like what should be changed, like what would be solved by this. And if you can show a, like an image of like, look at this page, this is so wrong. We've got to get rid of this one thing, like circle it, you know, show them in context and maybe a link to like the live page where you can see it if it's web software. Um, link specifically to the lines of code, highlight the ones that need to change. Step-by-step, step, make how to make the change and how to submit it, who to tell who to ask for help, and then lots more friendliness. So it's like very in-depth. It's this really, really uh, nitty gritty detail. Um, it's not just saying, this is a good first time or only issue. That's not, it's actually all this, all these extra steps to do it, but it's so worthwhile. Um, I won't talk about welcome pages too much, but we ultimately found it was better to just design our own page that pulled from the GitHub API and presented a menu of these for people to find. Ultimately that ran out because we had so many people just now people like we, it's almost instant that you have someone saying, I'd love to solve this, or I'd love to take this up. So we actually have a problem now where we have a problem supporting enough people. There's too much interest from new people coming in wanting, you know, I guess it's the, the sort of return on having been so friendly that now uh, everyone wants to, to do something. So we also, we also spaced it out. We said, you know, it actually takes quite a bit of work to do the formatting and all this stuff to make this kind of issue first timers only. So we'll even collect like a backlog of things that we think probably could eventually become one. Like, look, this thing is broken. It's probably only a couple lines of code change. So we'll just flag this and someone else at some point will be like, I need a new first timers only issue because someone's asking for one. This is actually now the thing. People are saying, could someone make me a first timers only issue? And we're like, oh man, I have to go look for one. So we actually have this candidates uh, pile that you can grab the top one and, and try to quickly reformat it. Um, I, you know, I, this, it's so hard, like the icons is a, is a whole conversation, but I think that, you know, once you are, are, you know, appreciating people, I really like that this has become a norm to show like this grid and uh, like some of them are like puppets or like, cartoon tigers or whatever, um, and that's okay. Um, but you know, it, I, I do think it's important to talk about or to communicate about who makes up your community. And then it's it's like um, the, the stereotypic, like it's all, you know, uh, cis white men um, and you can see them all because they're all the lead contributors. Uh, and, you know, uh, people will know because we do this a lot that their picture, their little thumbnail will appear. They can choose not to use a, a you know, have the auto-generated one if they want, but it's important to kind of put it out there. And I think like when you go into a space and you see that there are people who perhaps look like you, then you, there is something very important about that being communicated and not being kind of, not just saying, oh, we are very diverse. Um, Understanding that from an evaluation standpoint is a whole other topic, so we'll get into that later. Jeff, um, uh, Jeff, yeah. Sorry, I'm going yeah. to interrupt because we only have five minutes left. So okay. it would be great to have like a couple of minutes for questions. I'm going to skip everything else, and then I'm going to just show a few slides on hardware. Okay, and I'll do it for only like a couple minutes. I think that a lot of these ideas, especially about communicating through material about identity, about whether it's welcoming, are reproducible in hardware. And they come through in the focus on visual-based media, visual-based processes, things you can uh, compare uh, rather than focusing on absolute measurements, uh, things that um, have a visual element 
uh, as your first experience of them before you dig in underneath that, what it means. I think that there are things about the choice of particular materials like paper and even brownish paper that are meaningful to people and are quite hard to understand. But I think that designers do it all the time for commercial reasons. And I think that uh, as designers of open source, open source projects and measurement instruments, that there's a lot that these objects are communicating about, uh, about welcoming, uh, about friendliness, about a sense of humor, perhaps, and using Legos, um, but also about, um, you know, where do these things come from? And I was going to even talk about like, when you, you know, make something and you document it and all the wires are hard to follow versus if you've like carefully flattened them down into this kind of hieroglyphic so you can see where each wire goes. Uh, and you've taken just these very up close, clear photographs. There's a lot of these things. The choice of what kinds of technologies and where to put your problem solving, like plumber's putty is something that plumbers know about, but I don't think many like open source scientists or scientists know about plumber's putty. Um, so look it up. It's like a, it's a part of fixing pipes and it's really useful for waterproofing sensors. Um, and it's a very visible thing. It's not a fancy 3D printed thing. It's just something that you might find in a plumber toolbox. Um, so uh, like I said, I'm not gonna go through all of this. Uh, this is really interesting though. You should totally check this out. Um, but, um, and then the last thing I'll say is where do these things come from? And a lot of us are used to knowing science through a Eurocentric lens. And I, I just, I think that we have just barely scratched the surface of thinking about where in our own histories, um, you know, people from not, not from Europe, uh, without ancestors not from Europe, um, looking at what came before and was it known as um, science in the way we think about it today, you know? Uh, was it uh, a form of humor? Was it like a, a, a trap door or a, a trick or, or something to entertain or to tell a story? Was it part of food? Was it not biopolymer, but actually it was a form of making something delicious? Uh, and did people uh, have a different context for it? And without questioning where ideas come from, we won't be able to make the structural changes that I talked about back in the software slides. We won't be able to make different projects that are made out of completely different materials and completely different ways of, of knowing the world uh, that don't come from what you read in like a textbook or a reference guide. Um, and they're gonna look different from the sort of uh, the kinds of you know, bioscan sort of uh, imaging uh, and we're gonna have to understand them in different ways. And uh, yeah, so that's a lot of my work today. I'd be happy to talk more about it, but but yeah, I know we're low on time. So thank you so much, Jeff. This is so interesting. I think we all wish we could stay here listening to you. Um, so let's maybe take one minute to. I, I'm going to read out loud the first question in the etherpad because I think it's something that most of us are wondering or have wondered at some point, which uh, is. What are some effective ways to encourage folks to come back after their first contribution? Oh yeah, I almost I I I almost didn't even get into it. Um, I think that the best person to welcome someone into a community who is someone who has just been welcomed into a community because they know what it's like. They know thing they know better than the project maintainer. What is wrong with the process? Where are the most common places to get? Uh, tripped up they understand what it feels like emotionally to be to not know things you know? Uh, and they've gone through it much more recently than a project maintainer so we ask people who have just completed a first timers only issue to make one for someone else and that sounds like a pyramid scheme but it is it works super well and to ask people to step into a mentorship role as their second activity with the community is very powerful Great, thank you. That that sounds um, yeah, that sounds very interesting. Especially asking people to do to prepare the next contribution. Uh, I would like to implement that in my project now. But anyway, before we go off, um, um, we were wondering if you have uh, similar talks on YouTube or some material you can share or the link to these slides even so that we can read a bit, a bit more about all this work. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share the link to these slides. Uh, they're unlabeled. <laughs> so you just have to, you just have to, I don't know, message me on Instagram or something to find out, um, but I'll share it right now. Thank um, you. Hey guys, if uh, we reach the time, but I mean, we're over one minute, but if some of you want to stay a bit more, I mean, I don't know here if you can, we can ask you a few more things if you have a few more minutes, um, because this goes to YouTube. So at least, you know, uh, we have, we have it there. We felt, I think we all felt that uh, there was too, so much in your presentation. We, uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't see, um, but I mean, we can also end here because yeah, it's time. So, um, I think Jeff nodded that he has some time. So, folks who have to drop off, please do. We're going to continue recording for another few minutes. Hang out if you would like to. Super. Um, I have a ton of questions. Um, so, I'll read actually one that I wrote in the etherpad and then if you have more, keep writing them or ask them out loud. So my question, Jeff, is if you were able at Public Lab to really automatize the process of reviewing, the, especially like these small contributions, do they still require manual review or you were able to fully automatize it um, to take the burden of the maintainers? Um, no, we don't, we use pretty, small amount of automation. I mean, like we, we have like tests, a lot of tests, and um, we put a lot of work into trying to make the test output friendlier, which is pretty, it's a pretty bad state of affairs. Like a lot of, I mean, like for example, RuboCop, uh, which checks syntax in Ruby. Why is it called RuboCop? Like, can we just even start there? Um, <laughs> like, but, um, you know, the most common thing is that it'll put like a bunch of X's next to stuff that broke and that's just not friendly. Um, and you shouldn't have to see them all at once. You should start with just the first few and you should have resources in front of you, uh, people there to help you go through them. That's really tough. But so automation is mostly not friendly, but it can, it can still be useful. Um, yeah, I think we have a really tough moment in the first three days of outreachy every year because uh, everyone shows up and um, and we need to get like a few people in the door so they can start making first timers issues for other people. But after about three days, the the it's like the sourdough has risen and um, we have enough, uh, you know, uh, community who are helping other people. Uh, they're even like hosting um, online chats together uh, that we didn't organize to help each other out. And we're also just apologizing that like there is a moment where we can't be everywhere. And we just ask everyone to be patient uh, until we kind of like spin up enough community around it. Thanks for sharing that because um, it's our, in our organization, it's my second time as a mentor uh, on Outreachy and it's been overwhelming. So it's great to hear that everyone has these issues. Um, yeah, so thanks. Um, I think the key here is to actually get these first contributors to, to also create new issues. So thanks for this tip. Um, more questions? Uh, Malvika, you have your hand. I, I, have, I have a question, Jeff. Uh, you had some really interesting slides. And if you have a chance to share an example, I'd love that. Something that you were showing that let's go back in our own culture and see how science was used, how tools were developed. Were we just using it for you know, technology sake, or we were actually having fun with the technology. Um, because I, I think the, the example that you brought up about RoboCop, I feel like sometimes we use vocabulary to keep people out. Whereas historically in a lot of culture, science was just part of life and there was no separation between science and society. Can you share some example from your slides? Sure, I mean, um... I, I really like, I mean, I do a lot of food stuff and I really like uh, food um, as a, you know, as a thing. I, I kind of briefly showed this, but there's um, a tradition in Korean uh, cuisine of making gelatins out of different grains um, and they're, it's called muk and it's usually savory. And this, there's similar things in, in different parts of the world, um, like uh, basically kind of savory jellos. Um, it's, not, it's not super uncommon. Uh, in Korea, a lot of people do it with acorns. So dotari muk is like an acorn jello. And there's a lot of knowledge about polymerization that's going on in the in in making a jello out of an acorn. 
Um, and uh, there's a lot of knowledge about it and the texture of it. And people are exchanging that knowledge through their mouths. Um, you know, <laughs> you're eating it and you're understanding something about how this substance was polymerized. And that's a great example of a long tradition of biopolymers. And I'm not even gonna call it biopolymers. I think it's wrong to try to recontextualize this kind of knowledge into a European uh, framework. Um, but that's maybe, you know, when people are sharing biopolymer recipes, sometimes it just looks like they're making really bad mook or something, um, and uh, and sometimes good mook, but rarely edible. Um, and and yeah, I was working with an artist Elizabeth Lorenzi on trying to make uh, gelatin-based solar power uh, solar solar panels, um, uh, which were ultimately not edible due to some of the ingredients. But um, but yeah, uh, interesting nonetheless. And I, I'd love to keep working on that, but. I haven't had time. So. And recipes are, and, and not just recipes, but dishes, because recipes are a low resolution way to try to record a, a dish, right? Like most recipes don't actually have the information you need to make it. And that's good. That's not bad. That's not a failure of documentation. That's actually a protection of your ancestral knowledge in a way, you know? Uh, and and then sometimes it's also troubling. Like I would like to know about my Korean ancestors and I've been disconnected from Korean culture in many ways. And so I can't get a recipe that was passed on in my family for various reasons. So I have to like learn about it by watching like Korean YouTubers or something. And so maybe, you know, there's a way around that but maybe they're also making something and it's tapping into some taste memory that I have. And so there is communication based on some shared set of taste experiences or memories and it still works, you know? Um, or maybe just cause it's so meaningful to me. It means something very different to me than just anyone watching that YouTube video. And so that's a form of kind of communication documentation that's based on relationships and identity. Thanks, Jeff. You know, like um, <laughs> one more thought, sorry. I. I just excited. Um, you know, like when you make a sauce and then your like tomato sauce comes to mind and you cook it in a certain way and you get that, that orange foam on top. And uh, where does the orange come from? And, um, and when you read like science literature around, uh, you know, what would they call it? Like the formation of something, something due to the polymerization, something, you know, molecular and, um, and you, I kind of laugh because I mean, it's, I, I admire the curiosity, but you can't know that foam in that way, you know? <laughs> and I think that's kind of interesting, you know? Now you made me hungry. <laughs> okay, um, is there any last question or I will hand the word to Malvika. Thank you so much, Jeff. I think we can give a round of applause um, for this excellent an enlightening presentation. Um, Thanks, thanks all. So Have much. a great day. I, I love a talk with food in it. You nailed all of those <laughs> parts. And I'm, I'm also uh, very excited by how you're framing science in a very accessible way. Um, thank you so much. And folks who are watching us and who are still here, we have some assignments as always. We have persona and pathways. Uh, that you can create. Thanks to Melissa for giving us some framework and example. We've also provided links to uh, resources from Mozilla and the Turing Way. Um, please take a look. It has always been helpful for us. Even if you don't write all of them down, uh, one thing that Melissa said, sit down with your collaborators and talk about it. Think about community interaction and build your mountain of engagement. This is one of my most favorite thing. We always go back to discussing mountain of engagement again. So these are for you to think through your own processes and refine them. Sometimes we know a lot of things in our head, but no, don't put them down. Mountain of engagement is one of those things that really allows you to see your community on a paper. And finally, becoming aware of and deal with our own uh, unconscious bias. There are some guides and recommendations. Historically, we've actually taught this, but we removed it from our curriculum. However, we still think that it is useful for you to go back. Um, so next week, there is your mentor mentee call. Expert invitations should go out if it hasn't al already. We are very, very close to the ending. If you do not know, we just hit the mid of this whole cohort. Week 10, we will discuss uh, open science knowledge dissemination. 
So um, if you have been thinking about some of your own projects, how you're gonna talk about it, this would be the time. Any project related assignment that you haven't been able to catch up with, take some time to look through, ask us question. We love when people ask us question. Um, and we'll see you next time and on Slack. Thank you everyone and all the speakers and all the lovely facilitators. Great hanging out. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks. Ciao. Bye.